Good morning. good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when you may be watching this service at home. Our announcer-in-chief is in Birmingham with her son, so you're stuck with me this morning. First of all, we, some of you, most of you who are at homecoming will remember that Brian and Sharon O'Neill graciously gave us a magnolia that is descended from a magnolia that was growing on Mount Vernon when George Washington lived there. And that tree was planted yesterday. It's out west of the pavilion someday, not this year, but someday it will provide shade for the pavilion. So we want to our prayer appreciate. Would you join me in thanking Sharon Brown? <laughs> that magnolia is very appropriate if you think about it. When this church began, uh, it was 44 years after independence. Now, some of us can remember 1976. For some of us, it wasn't all that long ago. And for some of the founders of this church, uh, they could well remember 1776. And it may even be that some of them served in the Continental Army. I wish we knew. We don't have records about that. But it's possible. It's entirely possible. And so it's entirely appropriate that that uh, tree should be there on these historic grounds. And so we're grateful to the O'Neills for making that happen. Our mission of the month is not mentioned in the worship folder except for those who got it online, and that's, let's do safe place again. We've talked about how uh, the pandemic has worsened domestic violence. And by the way, let me mention that there's not only physical violence, there's also verbal violence. And safe place provides counseling for victims of verbal violence as well as shelter for those who are victims of physical violence. And so. If you wish to make an extra contribution to Safe Place, uh, just put an extra check in the offering plate or indicate uh, in your giving that what amount you want to go to uh, Safe Place. Also remember that May 23rd is Pentecost and we will be worshiping outside again. And we will have a meal uh, for the first time in a long, well, first time since homecoming. We will have a church meal again. May 23rd is Pentecost, 50 days after Easter and we will be celebrating outside. Uh, also, session members, remember next Sunday is the second Sunday of the month, and so it will be our usual meeting time. Those are all the announcements that I know about. And is there anything that, oh, yes, there is. I was kind of text about it. Thank you, Heather. Um, the ladies will be meeting this Wednesday evening in the fellowship hall, and Heather tells me that you're having a fiesta I don't know exactly what that means, but you can come and find out what that means, okay? So that's going to be this Wednesday evening, do not forget. Wednesday evening, all ladies are welcome here. Uh, yes, Sharon? I just want to thank Jerry Walker for helping us yesterday. He did, he just saved us with his golf cart to plan. Okay. But he gives us a lot of recognition for All right, thank you, Jerry. Maybe, maybe you should name your golf cart Magnolia now. It probably is an amazing name, doesn't it? Let's <laughs> not go too far here. Uh, all right, so I think those are all of the uh, announcements that we need to be concerned about. Isaiah said, those who wait in the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not grow faint. I suspect many of us here could use a new burst of strength in one way or another. So let's take a few moments and quietly wait on the Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Let us worship. If you are here in the sanctuary with me, please stand if you are able for a call to worship. Come and sit with me. We shall study the word. Together, Together we, we shall, shall read and understand. and understand. Come and kneel with me. We shall break the bread. Together, Together we, we shall eat and be satisfied. Come and walk with me, we shall part the waters. Together, Together we, we shall, shall risk and be whole. We shall be changed. And you may be seated. 
And we come now to our prayer of confession. Uh, one of the, as you've heard me say before, one of the important spiritual disciplines of the Christian life is self-examination and confession. And we do that as a church family in our weekly prayer of confession. So if you care to join with me as we pray together in unison saying, Good Shepherd, we take your care for granted. In the midst of your many blessings, we complain of not having enough. In the presence of danger, we fail to trust your abiding love. When you set a table before us, we turn aside from you. Call us back into your care and help us trust your caring presence that our actions may proclaim your truth. Amen. And we continue with our silent and personal prayers of confession. Now, by the authority of the one who calls us together, Jesus Christ, our Lord, all of our sins and misdeeds, failures and mistakes are forgiven. And so we can continue rejoicing in worship and in song. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, most of you probably already know I'm not a great announcer, but uh, that torch has been passed to me for this this morning. Uh, our uh, guest artist is Mr. Paul Goins. Some of you may know him. Um, he's a, a fine musician, and in fact, he will be uh, uh, presenting a song that he wrote himself just yesterday, and it's a really nice song. Um, it occurred to me, though, that this is, we started a new month, and um, uh, so I was going to announce the birthdays for this month. Um, starting with uh, Alan Austin uh, on the 13th, Hannah Bowling on the 15th, Renee Muse on the 16th, Chet Holt on the 19th, Matthew Kimbrew on the 20th, uh, Scott Gravely on the 29th, and Haley Holt on the 31st. So uh, I have asked uh, Paul to, uh, to lead us in the happy birthday song. Because my voice is still, still in a bad way. Happy birthday to you.
So Psalm 22, beginning with verse 25. From you comes my praise and the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. I think that includes you and me. And all the families of the nation shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him, indeed, shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord, and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. And, of course, in this Easter season... 
we think that uh, what he has done is, of course, the resurrection of our Lord. Continuing on during the Easter season, we read excerpts from Acts, and so Acts 8, beginning with verse 26, a story I referred to recently in a sermon, I believe, maybe a couple weeks ago, a familiar story about Philip and the Ethiopian official. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. Most people in ancient times read out loud. Silent reading is a modern phenomenon. He asked, Philip asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What is to pre prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. And then our epistle reading from 1 John. We've been reading excerpts from 1 John. Now we've come to chapter 4, beginning with verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. For God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. <clears throat> God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this way, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters, are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. And then our gospel reading from John 15, part of the 
Last Supper Discourse, as it's commonly called. Luke John 15, verses 1 through 8. Jesus is speaking and he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. And we'll pick up at that point actually next week. We all know that the bald eagle is the symbol of the United States. It's on the great seal, etc. Well, the symbol of Israel was a vine. Over the temple, over the main entrance of the temple, was a vast golden uh, grapevine with uh, large golden clusters of grapes. The vine was the symbol of Israel in the Maccabean era when for a brief time Israel enjoyed independence. The coins it minted had a vine on them, just as our coins have a, a bald eagle on the national symbol on the coins. It had a vine on them. There are half a dozen Old Testament references to Israel as God's vineyard, as God's vine. For example, Isaiah 5, 7 says, The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the people of Judah. But verse 4 in that same song also says, When I expected my vineyard to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? Israel became a worthless vine in this passage in Isaiah when it did not remain faithful to the Lord in worship and in obedience. It became a worthless vine, a wild grape vine. So when Jesus says, I am the true vine, or I am the real vine, he is saying that those who stay connected to him are the true Israel of God. They are the real people of God. So the question is, how does one stay connected to Jesus? Abiding is the word used in our text, but I think uh, maybe the word connected communicates better to us. We don't use the word abide very much anymore. Those of you who have heard me for a long time, you know that I'm always interested in how questions. It frustrates me when people, somebody tells me to, how to, tells me to do something, but does, don't tell me how to do it. I'm a very pragmatic person. I want to know the how of things. How do you do it? And so, uh, I'm, so I'm interested, how do we stay connected? The text tells us to stay connected, but how do we do that? Well, our text suggests three ways that we can stay connected to Jesus. First of all, we stay connected by staying pruned. We stay connected by staying pruned. The, it's not obvious in the English, but in the Greek text, and I, and I wish English translators, they should just do it, translate it this way. The same word translated prune and cleanse or clean in our text is the same Greek word. So Jesus, when Jesus says in verse, uh, the second, first, second and third verses, he removes every branch in me that bears fruit. For every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been pruned by the word that I have spoken to you. That's the way it should be translated. In the Greek, it's the same word. He prunes every branch, and you have already been pruned by the word I have spoken to you. So Jesus uses, uses this metaphor that just as a vineyard grower prunes grapevines to increase yield, so God prunes or cleans us, if you prefer that translation, so that we can bear more fruit. And how does that happen? How does the pruning take place? Well, Jesus you, says, you have been pruned by the word that I have spoken to you. So if we want to be pruned of what keeps us from being fruitful, well, that means frequent, 
ideal, ideally daily exposure to the words of Jesus, the words that Jesus spoke, not just mindless reading, but actually reflecting on those words. How do, those, how do these words apply to me and to my circumstances? How do they call me to change? What do they invite me to do? What we're talking about here is, of course, the spiritual discipline of self-examination and confession. Examining ourselves, examining our attitudes, examining our actions in light of the teachings of Jesus, in light of what the Bible says, and then making appropriate changes as we do so. William Barclay points out that vines need a lot of time consuming attention. Anybody who's ever grown a few grapevines, I know Philip Bowling does, uh, knows that vines require a lot of attention. I did a, um, a wedding once in a vineyard shortly after the vineyard had been pruned. And you know, there wasn't much there. <laughs> Those grapevines were pruned down to almost nothing. It was a, somebody spent a lot of time on that and there wasn't a whole lot left. And so, do we require a lot of time-consuming attention if we're going to be adequately pruned so that we can truly be fruitful? Fruit-bearing does not happen, happen by allowing our lives to run wild. An unpruned grapevine simply runs wild and it doesn't produce many grapes. In fact, I have some grapevines, I guess they're wild grapevines, growing on the back fence at my place They've never been pruned, and they never produce any fruit either. They just grow, keep growing every year and get bigger and bigger. And so fruit bearing does not happen by our allowing our wives, lives to just run wild. Discipleship implies discipline. They come from the same word. A disciple is someone under discipline. Rich, uh, uh, Richard Foster in his famous book, uh, about spiritual practices entitled it Celebration of Discipline. Most of us don't think as discipline something to celebrate, but if Donnie, see, I, see I'm using Donnie as an illustration. Uh, if Donnie had not disciplined himself to practice the violin, he would not sound very good when he gets up here and plays it, would he? There's, there's a, uh, he's able to celebrate, we're able to celebrate with him in his play, the same thing of truth, of course, would be Paul, but Donnie's the one I choose for picking on Paul. So don't, don't, don't have your feelings hurt, okay? Uh, so, uh, this, so to be fruitful, whether we're talking about being fruitful in violin playing or fruitful in living a Christian disciple life, it requires discipline. It requires attention. It requires time-consuming attention to prune that which needs to be pruned. Barclay also points out that we become useless as vines when, one, we simply refuse to listen to Jesus. Secondly, we just give him lip service. We say Jesus is Lord and let it go at that. Or we just abandon him altogether, which always is an option. John Sanford says that God seeks to destroy everything in us that is not fit to exist. That's an intriguing phrase, isn't it? God seeks to destroy in us everything that is not fit to exist and invites us to reflect on what is it in me that isn't fit to exist? What is it in me that should not be there? What is there in you that isn't fit to exist that really should not be there? Well, the point of our passage is that Jesus' word will show us what those things are. Jesus' word will show us what in us is, is not fit to exist and will enable us to prune it out of our lives and so stay connected with Jesus and so bear fruit. The fruit of, well, we'll talk about that a little bit later, the fruit of love. And then secondly, we stay connected by staying in touch with Jesus. We stay connected by pruning our lives through his word and we also stay connected by staying in touch with him. How do we stay in touch? Well, we know the answer. By worship and praise, by prayer and meditation, by living a with Christ life, living in Christ, as Paul so frequently describes it, living in Christ, practicing the presence, 
practicing the presence, being, uh, uh, making ourselves conscious on a regular basis, frequent basis, that I am not alone, that Christ is with me, and my ter I turn my attention to his presence with me and make life a running conversation with Jesus. And Henri Nouwen calls it wasting time with Jesus. Wasting time with Jesus. After all, there are other things we could be doing. We could be playing video games. We could be listening to music. We could be watching some sports, you know, sports channels with sports on just about 24 hours a day. Could be all kinds of things we could be doing, right? But we can choose to waste time with Jesus. You know, to stay connected with friends, we have to stay in touch either in person, or by phone calls, or social media, or maybe even the old-fashioned way of writing a letter. I guess there are still people who write letters once in a while now. We have to stay, if we're going to stay connected with friends, we have to stay in touch, or even if we're going to stay connected with relatives, that can be a challenge too, can't it? We have to stay in touch. And that uh, also implies fellowship with other this the idea of staying in touch with Jesus also implies fellowship with uh, other believers in whom Christ lives, other Christ-like believers, people in whom we see the spirit of Jesus. You know, vine implies community, doesn't it? The branches are connected to the vine, and thereby they are connected to each other. It's kind of like Paul's body analogy in 1 Corinthians 12, you remember, where he says uh, that we are the body of Christ and individually members of it, so we each have a different function, but we are intricately connected to one another, we need one another. Not, not all of us are violin players, not all of us are guitar players, not all of us are singers. We have different functions, not all of us are tree planters. We have different functions. But we need one another. Together we make up the body of Christ, or back to, to Jesus' analogy, together we make up the vine that is Christ. So by being committed to the vine, the branches are also, by being connected to the vine, I should say, I guess the two kind of go together, don't they? Commitment and connection. By being connected to the vine, the branches are also connected to one another. As First John says, I'm writing you so that you can have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. So we stay connected by letting our lives be pruned. We stay connected by staying in touch. And we also stay connected to Jesus by loving. That's the main thing the fruitfulness is about, by loving. In our passage in 1 John 4, we read about abiding. We read that same word about connecting. And verse 16 says, God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God. Those who continue to love continue to be connected to God, and God abides in them. God remains connected to them. Therefore, as verse 7 says, let us love one another. That's Jesus' most fundamental, distinctive command. You remember in John 13, he says, I'm giving you a new commandment. It's my commandment. It's that which is most distinctive of me. Love one another. This is how everybody will know that you're followers of me if you love one another. If you don't love, then people are going to well, you're just an ordinary person. They're not going to recognize you as a follower of Jesus unless you love. So those, and so verse 20 says, those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. Now these are tough words, folks. Because it's easy to fall into hate, isn't it? Especially in 21st century America. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they cannot see. And then there's this amazing statement in verse 12. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us 
and his love is perfected in us. Where do I see God? I see God in someone who's loving. Maybe loving against all odds. Maybe loving the unlovable. Maybe continuing to love when there's every good reason not to love. That's where God is seen, the apostle says. No one's ever seen God, but when we love one another, his love is perfected in us. And so people may come here and they're not going to visibly see God. But if they truly see us loving, they'll say, well, God is, must be in this place. They will see God in us. So do we want others to know and be connected to God, the God in whom we believe and profess? Then the simple and what we do is love, faithfully, consistently, indiscriminately, we love, and these others whom we want to see God will see God in us, and we will remain connected to Jesus. As Ode says, the mark of the faithful community, the mark of the faithful congregation, is how it loves, not who its members are, not who makes up the membership, but how it loves. That is the mark of a faithful community. There is only one gift, he says, to bear fruit, and the fruit is love. And any branch, any branch, even me, even you, any branch can do that, can bear fruit, can love, if it remains in Jesus, if it remains connected to the word of Jesus, and let that, lets that word prune it, if it remains, stays connected to Jesus, stays in touch with Jesus, then any branch, even the likes of you and me, can bear the fruit of love. Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory for our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me for the Apostles' Creed? We remind ourselves of what we believe as people have been doing on this spot of ground for 200 years and we bear witness to what we believe and hopefully what we believe will produce the fruit of love so join with me as we as we recite together this ancient creed saying i believe in god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth and in jesus christ his only son our lord who was conceived by the holy ghost born of the virgin mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead and buried, he descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead and descended into heaven. There he sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I slipped into modern version there for a moment. Holy Spirit instead of Holy Ghost. Same thing. Um, all right, let's turn to our prayer piece today then. Uh, we always pray for an Earth Alabama Presbytery, and we'll be pray, pray for our session. We pray about the COVID epidemic, and uh, Vina wants us to pray for Tracy, who is a um, relative of, of sorts. Uh, Tracy is on a, has COVID and is on a ventilator uh, having a difficult time. So we'll pray for her. And of course, once we're special, remember the people of India that are suffering the most from the COVID pandemic right now. We always pray about the opioid and suicide epidemic. And we pray for the healing of hate, anger, prejudice, and violence. Cancer patients that we always pray for, Sadie, Jennifer, Doug, Wayne, Beverly, Dolores, Whitney, John, uh, Corey, Brian, uh, Mark, uh, and Bill, we will pray for. I want to continue praying for Franklin and for Murphy, for uh, uh, Valerie and for her brother Mark, for Jimmy, and for Charlie, who is in Summer's uh, uh, rehab. Uh, and um, uh, Wanda wants to remember her sister again, Paulette, who is back in the hospital. And we continue praying for, for Alex and for Jim. 
So those are the people we, I know of that we will pray for. And uh, let's take a few moments so that you can add to that list silently those whom you wish to remember before God in the presence of this uh, family of God and whatever personal needs you may have that you wish to pray about. Let's take a few moments for silent prayer. Our Father, we know that we are connected to you and we are connected to those for whom you care. And we want to be connected to all of these people whom we have just named, whether silently or aloud. We want to be connected with them in prayer, in a spiritual communion with them. And we want to be connected with them by doing anything that we can to be of, of help. If there's some way that we can help anyone whom we have just named, we ask that you would grant us the grace, the opportunity, and the grace and the skill to do so. So we entrust your loving care, all of those whom we have just named before you. We entrust your loving care, all of us who are hearing my voice right now. And we ask that you would keep all of us very conscious of your love, and that you would keep us connected with you, connected with one another, and connected with all those who are in need. So we lift before you all of those for whom we care, all of those whom we have just named. We entrust them to your love and your grace, and we entrust all of us to your love and grace as we pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We will continue our worship now by receiving our tithes and offerings. and said, take, eat, this is my body, do this to remember me, the body of Christ. We remember also that after supper on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took a cup, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood given for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
the blood of Christ. Would you pray with me, please? Now, our Father, remembering the body and blood of Christ, remembering the price paid for our forgiveness, remembering the love with which you love us, may we leave here not only loved, but also loving. May we leave here not only forgiven, but also forgiving. May we leave here not only accepted, but also accepting. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Now by the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, may we live lives so connected to Jesus that our lives will bring glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, one God, blessed forever and ever. Amen. Amen.